ancient Krakow, an early capital of Poland, stands the medieval castle of Wawel. Here lived Poland's kings, rulers also of Lithuania and the Ukraine in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. The Middle Ages were for Poland the Golden Ages. The Church of St. Mary in Krakow symbolizes the influences that shaped Polish culture. The Christian religion from Rome, and Gothic architecture from France. In its day, Krakow was a leading city of Europe. More than 20 generations of students have studied at Krakow's famous university. Among them, the great Polish astronomer, Copernicus. Castle and fortress bear silent witness to the feudal nature of Poland's past a past brought vividly to life for Poland school children by frequent excursions to historic spots. In the 17th century, the Polish kings moved to this castle in Warsaw, making that city the capital. This was Warsaw Cathedral, and this was Warsaw's old market square, ringed by quaintly decorated buildings 300 years old and more. These were the last motion pictures taken in Warsaw before the war. All this is gone now. In this Baroque palace lived Poland's last king. In 1795, he was forced to abdicate. Weakened by internal disunity, Poland was partitioned between Russia, Austria, and Germany. For 130 years, Poland was suppressed and exploited. For 130 years, Poland was enslaved, her patriots persecuted. Not until 1919, after the First World War, did Poland regain her independence. Ruined by the very war that brought her freedom, Poland set out bravely to create a modern unified nation. Poland's first and gravest problem was her primitive agriculture. In such manor houses lived the wealthy landowners of pre-war Poland. They owned much of the best farmlands. Their politics, like their social customs, were feudal. These are the landlord's hired hands. These peasants have no land of their own, so they must work on the estate. They work very hard. They get very little. sincere attempts at agrarian reform were always defeated by the feudal lords of the manor houses, owners of the great estates. Many peasants had, like these, their own small farms, but they were not much better off than the hired hands on the estates. Farm machinery was crude and old-fashioned. The horse was the only source of motive power. Before the war, 65% of all the people in Poland lived in backward peasant villages, hard to reach and slow to change. If a peasant had anything left over after feeding his family, he carried it to the marketplace in the nearest town. These are typical market scenes in Krakow in 1937. They show commerce in its most primitive form. In vivid contrast to the drab life of the Polish peasants were their colorful costumes. Designs differed in each province. This is in Lovich province, near Warsaw. These beautiful garments were all made at home by hand. The ceremonies of the church are an important part of Polish life in town and country. In 
any Polish village, the most important person was the priest. To his flock, he was the supreme authority in all matters. In the Carpathian Mountains, bordering Czechoslovakia, live Poland's mountaineers. Their isolated life has produced still another of Poland's many regional cultures. Everything about the lives of these proud mountain people is picturesque and quaint, the delight of foreign tourists. Social progress is made slow and difficult by the inertia of tradition-bound groups like these. Despite the fancy costumes, their lives were poor and bleak. Another province, another costume. These are the more somber peasants of Polish Silesia in their Trojak dance. one-third of the population of old Poland were not Poles. Here is a village of Ukrainians, the largest minority group. The land you see here is now included within Poland's friendly neighbor, the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. Inability to solve the national minority problem fairly was a major cause of Poland's internal weakness when war came. Another large minority group were the Jews brought to Poland in the 14th century by Polish nobles who needed their skills. Those who were not assimilated lived in wretched ghettos, preserving their own language, religion, and medieval dress. In the 1930s, when the Nazi infection began to penetrate Poland, Jews were persecuted. Between 1940 and 1944, the German occupation forces in Poland committed the most hideous mass murder in history among these innocent victims. Only a handful of all the human beings you have seen here are alive today. This poster asks for money to build new schools. In the 20 brief years between two wars, Poland made earnest efforts to improve education. Kindergartens were often under church supervision. Only a small number of fortunate city children could be sure of good schooling and a comfortable life. In a Warsaw Park, beneath a monument to the great Polish composer Chopin, babies sleep peacefully in the sun. This was the year before the war. steel-framed buildings of American design were Warsaw's pride in 1938. New buses and private cars contrasted with the ancient droszki. Let's take a streetcar ride through Warsaw as it was then. news 
was bad news in those last days of the Nazi war of nerves. This funeral might be marching out of the Middle Ages. Here the old was not abandoned, nor was the new at home. Warsaw was young, Warsaw was growing. Yet the foreman on this construction job treats workers as the overseer on the estate treated the peasants. These modern apartments were built by workers' cooperative societies, a sign of social advance in any land. The workers' standard of living remained low. Poland's chief mineral resources were coal, zinc, and oil. From 50 to 80 percent of Poland's industry was financed by foreign capital. This is the largest zinc works in Silesia. It was owned and operated by an American firm. Polish workers received low wages, but prices were low too. They were protected by social security and health laws much better than in some other European countries. For instance, the labor laws required the employer to supply free milk to smelters. Women and girls were widely employed in industry. Polish workers organized trade unions, striving for a true democracy. The major industry of Poland was mining. The best miners in the world come from Poland. Many American miners are of Polish descent. Before the war, most of Poland's coal was exported. This mine is in Silesia. It was controlled by foreign capital. It did not work primarily for the benefit of Poland. At the end of a hard day's work, these miners have earned barely enough to buy one day's food for their families. This is pre-war Poland. The corridor across Pomerania was Poland's only gateway to the Baltic Sea. Railways brought Poland's many exports to the new city of Gdania. Only a few years earlier, these shores had been barren sand dunes. The swift construction of this great modern seaport was one of Poland's outstanding achievements. It was characteristic of Poland's economy that most of her exports were raw materials, among them much lumber. Only a few miles from Gdynia was Danzig, used by Germany from Poland in medieval times. After the First World War, Danzig became a free city, administered by the League of Nations. These ancient grain elevators stand beside the Vistula River, storing Polish grain for export. Then the Nazis filtered into Danzig and made it a fascist bomb planted at Poland's doorstep. Poland's leaders were military men. They answered force with force. They enlarged the Polish army. Shopkeepers hastened to display portraits of Poland's rising strongmen. The last Polish president bestows a marshal's baton upon Poland's new dictator, General Smigli Rydz. With it goes the last vestige of Poland's democracy. Poland was now a police state. people, always intensely patriotic, trusted their army and its leader. They did not see that their army's equipment was obsolete and scanty.
did not know that these few old-fashioned planes overhead were the entire Polish Air Force, but the Nazi High Command knew. On September 1st, 1939, in Poland, the Germans first revealed what they meant by Blitzkrieg. The Polish army put up a fierce and desperate resistance. German panzer columns stabbed deep into Poland's heart, severing communications. Poland was overwhelmed, yet Poland would not surrender. Polish cavalry attacked German tanks with such courage that they won a few temporary victories against the world's most frightful war machine. The struggle of men against machines was tragically unequal. Refugees streamed into Warsaw. Volunteers were building fortifications for a last stand. The government escaped. The population fought on. Although bombed and shelled mercilessly, Warsaw held. Rescue squads worked day and night digging people out of smashed buildings. The dead fell faster than they could be buried. Women and children were the frontline soldiers in this new kind of total war. New-made orphans clung to what they could. Their church shattered, their faith unshaken. Warsaw starved while Warsaw fought. Every day the bread ration grew smaller. Housewives stood in line for hours exposed to German artillery fire. In a bombed hospital, the maternity ward is moved to the cellar for safety. This wounded baby is only three days old. Doctors and nurses work days without sleep. For 28 days, Warsaw withstood alone the full fury of the German army and air force. When Warsaw finally fell, all Europe was in flames. For six years, the Germans devastated Poland and slaughtered its population. Helped by the Allies, the Polish underground continued to resist enslavement. Today, Poland is once more independent and free. This is how the capital of Poland looked on the day of its liberation in January 1945. The history of Poland had never before seen such devastation. Polish soldiers entering from the east are greeted and cheered by the survivors. Life was at a standstill. Today, life moves again in the shattered streets. Again, Poland digs herself out of war's ruins. Again, a new Poland is rising from the ashes. In this, the women of Poland are playing an important part. There are not many men left. The people of Poland are resolved to build a new capital, a new country. They want to break with the remnants of the feudal past. For the sake of generations to come, the new Poland believes that a better and happier life can be achieved by Poland and by all mankind.